Okay, I want to welcome everybody to another exciting episode of Saturday Cup of Joe. Uh, I like to thank all you guys who are watching. I like to thank all you guys who are on a different uh, a link right now. Um, guys, thank you for joining us. I know it's a pretty day for most of y'all, but uh, you know, knowledge is power, and I love when we bring on interesting guests. Uh, here's a guy that's been on oh my goodness, different talk shows. Uh, <laughs> the guy has been actually a, a internet marketer for a while been in the industry for about over 15 years i'm sure but by now um he's a best-selling author um he's a wonderful dad and i know this guy is generous and uh i'm gonna give you a shout out here in a minute but anyway i like to bring on uh my guest ryan douglas uh it's coming from new york right yep long island thanks for having <laughs> me Landon. it's a pleasure now real quick man i'm gonna give you a shout out because uh my wife and I, we were in New York eating this cake. And uh, I was showing everybody this cake I was eating. And it was like at a place called the Premier Deli, Deli I believe. And you pinged me. It's like, Lim, you still there? And I was like, oh, God, that's Ryan Douglas. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I was like, no, man, we still, we're about to leave. I mean, we were just sitting there waiting for our, our bus to, oh, no, what was it? Our taxi to come and get us. And, uh, when you think, I thought, man, I should just stay another day just to hang out with this brother. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, I was going to come through, man. Chop it up a little bit, you know? Yeah, man. Just I was like, wow. person. <laughs> That is awesome. So, awesome, man. Thank you for coming on the show, man. And, um, wow, this is great. So, let me ask you this. Um, the pressure of being on TV, how did you handle that? <laughs> uh, that's a good question. That's right. a good question. You're a little nervous at first, but it's like you go out there and like I, I discovered this ability about myself that I'm kind of able to turn it on. Right. And I think it goes back to, you know, I used to play basketball in college and we used to have a lot of people watching. So I was never nervous then. And, you know, just something about it. I'm nervous at first. But when I get that out there, I'm able to turn it on. And you never really know right. what you're able to do until you try it. Right. Until, you know, some people say, I'd never do that. I'd never try to do that. But you never know if you have that ability or not until you give it a try. And some people, it takes longer to develop it. But it's nothing but when you go out there, you just imagine that you're having a conversation with one person, just like me and you are doing now. And yeah. you don't think about, you know, the cameras and millions of people watching. You just think, okay, I'm just having answering the questions and I'm just going to relax. Well, you know, that brings up a, a very important topic because I know there's a lot of people that wants to do certain things and no one can explain their product like themselves. And they will actually eventually have to go see people and talk to them about it. And I think that's a hang up where most people get at. But I feel your pain, man. Um, wow. I remember I've had a couple of big meetings that I was I wasn't comfortable with the number that I <laughs> proposed, but I had to turn it on. It's me. You know what I mean? And I'm thinking, man, how's he get in front of those cameras like that? You know? <laughs> yeah. So you sink or swim and see if you do or you look like a fool. So you got to do what you got to do, right? right. Right. Your back, now, your back's against the wall. You do what you got to do. I saw your uh, interview with Wendy Williams, and um, you was trying to get her to help you. And she was like, now nah, you do it. I'm thinking, yeah. man, <laughs> you just had to add them. I was like, well, she's giving him rough on this, man, you know? Now, that was probably the most difficult one I did, <laughs> right? Because it was the first time I was cooking live right. on television. And she's a high energy person. So her producers the whole time backstage were telling me, make sure you keep your energy up. Make right. sure you get her involved. We want to try to get her cooking and all this stuff. And I'm out there, and I'm like, before I get on, I'm backstage, nervous as hell. I'm like shadow boxing. Right. And I'm like pump, getting myself pumped up. And you can see it when I first walk on, and I'm like a real laid back guy. When right. I first walk on, I'm like, hey, you know, like <laughs> I have a lot of energy, and it was hilarious. And my wife looks at it and just cracks up. But it was, uh, you know, I had to go out there and I did, try to do what they said, but she refused to. Yes. And she put her shades on at one point and just was like stepped back and was rushing me to finish. And it was just the most awkward thing. But I was just kind of happy to be on the show because that was, a, you know, a good look for me at the time. I was, I'm not any celebrity or anything to be on her show, daytime TV, with all these people watching. I, you know, it was really good for book sales. So, you know. Yeah, just, man. It looked like that she went completely out of character by just putting her shades on. I was like, what is she doing? <laughs> you know? <laughs> I was thinking the same thing, but you know, fun, funny story about that is uh, when I was growing up, I used to have a crush on Tyra Banks. Okay. Tyra Banks had her own show. You know, everybody had the Tyra Banks poster on the wall with the, the bikini, you know, right, she was right. a model. 
And um, right after I did the Wendy Williams show, maybe two weeks later, I get a call from the Tyra Banks show. And her producers, they want to have me on, right? So it was, it was a set. We had set a date for me to come on, and we were doing our initial like uh, preparation call that we were having. Mm-hmm. And they started asking me like, where else have you been on? And I was like, well, recently I was on the Wendy Williams show about two weeks ago, and then their voice just dropped. They said, oh, oh, you're on Wendy Williams? What the heck? Tyra doesn't follow Wendy. I'm sorry, oh, we, we can't have you on. Oh, 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 oh. Like, oh, so all these, all these years I wanted to meet Tyra Banks, and because I did the Wendy Williams show, they wouldn't have me on because I, you know, they Tyra doesn't follow Wendy. I'm like, oh, that's some diva stuff right there. That is wow. I didn't know that was in the back scenes. I mean, I'm kind of sure these networks have the certain ways they want to follow show up with certain companies or sister stations. I'm sure that's what's going on there. You yeah. know. I should have never said that. It probably wouldn't yeah. even have found out. Man. I just put my foot in my mouth. I had no idea that that would happen. <laughs> wow. So let's go back, way back in the day, man. How were you as a kid, man, as a child? As a child? I was yeah. a, a young, shy child, man. I was an introvert. I was this funny-looking, chubby kid. As a, you know, if you want to go way, way back, yeah. I mean, yeah. until I, I started play, catching on to basketball at an early age. And that kind of gave me a lot of confidence as I got better at it and gave me a lot of swagger. And, you know, in high school and college, I started being more popular. But, you know, elementary school, I was just like nerdy, chubby kid that was an introvert. So that, that was me. Did you have any brothers and sisters? Yeah, I have a younger brother and I have a younger sister. My brother is uh, 36, so he's five years younger than me. And my sister is actually 19 years younger than me. So she, you know, as I was graduating from college, she ended up, well, in college, she was born. Right. Nice, nice. So um, was there ever any male figure in your life or any type of family member that was like an entrepreneur that had that spirit that you kind of watched over? You know, my, my dad was an entrepreneur, but he was like the worst kind of entrepreneur. He was, uh, he was a hustler. He used to sell drugs and stuff, to be honest. <laughs> And he used to sell all type of stuff, but you know he used to make money selling drugs. And he caught up with him. And my my dad actually died six weeks before I was born. Mm. So I never met him, and it was just so crazy that my um I don't I don't mean to like change the whole tone of the yeah, no no this is like yeah, sorry to cut the Joe man we yeah. do it all man <laughs> yeah, but, that, but that's the story I mean that's what happened my, my parents met in uh, April of 1974. They were married in April 1974. My dad passed in August of 1974. Mm. And, you know, right after, you know, shortly after they were married. And then six weeks later, in October of 1974, I was born. And my dad was found uh, dead on a rooftop. They don't know whether he overdosed or whether he was killed by, you know, but I know he sold drugs and stuff like that. So I kind of grew up in a single parent household and that motivated me and inspired me. My mother went through a depression after he died and she was 19 and he was 20 at the time. So you have a bunch of, you know, two young kids, you know, just get married and this tragedy happened. And then, then I come along like right, right after that. So, you know, I grew up in a a difficult neighborhood in uh, Jamaica, Queens in a single parent household. And it inspired me to like, once I got the chance to have my own family, I wanted everything to be rock solid. I wanted to be that dad I always wished I had. So that motivated me throughout my whole life to not to use drugs, to you know stay on the straight and narrow, to you know do the right thing. Because of that experience, I didn't want my kids to have the same experience. That is nice to hear that you actually were wanting to do something. You know, most kids take a different turn and they just hang out with the crazies and just go off the ropes, man. And then that's it for them, you know. But you. Took a whole new angle, which was awesome. Um, I myself grew up with a single, uh, you know, parent, and uh, I, I know how it is. You know, and I had like four sisters that was always driving me crazy, but I always knew that I was going to do something <laughs> to get out of the house and do something for myself. You know what I mean? <laughs> for sure. Yeah, yeah I was, you know, I've been an entrepreneur since early on. I always had that kind of hustle in me. I just wanted to do it legally, I suppose. Right. Right. You no know, type of. You know MLMs, and you know I shoveled snow. I cut hair in college. I had a booth in a flea market. I, you know, I had a lemonade stand. I mean, I've done everything you could think of in terms of uh, trying to become an entrepreneur. And then this internet marketing stuff was what, what kind of hit, and it was kind of like my thing. Right. Very nice. So in college, let's go. While you were in college, did you know exactly what you were going to do in college, or did you have to figure it out, or what was going on there? I just knew I wanted to play basketball. <laughs> that's all I did. That's the only. That's like the reason I went to college. I was just into hoops, man. That's all I did. 
I actually have an alumni game today, later on today, oh. at, at my school that I'm going to. I still play a little bit. I'm 41 now, but right. yeah, I still try to get up that, and down a little bit. Hopefully, I don't like break an ankle or something today. Not so much. Got to stretch, man. Yeah, yeah. But I, I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I knew I wanted to do business. But right. at the school, I went to the University of Stony Brook out in Long Island. Small uh, SUNY State University out in Long Island. Well, it's not small, but it's like not as known as like a you know Duke or something. Right. So uh, I didn't know what I wanted to do. They didn't have a business school at the time, so I did the closest thing, which was economics. So that was my major in college. But I always knew I wanted to have my own business one day. I just didn't know what to do. Mm, nice, nice. So when you graduated from college, what was your first job? My first job out of college was I uh, worked at Staples. Oh. I was working at, I was an uh, operations manager, a service manager at uh, Staples. Right. For a couple years. And that was like the worst job ever. I hated that job. <laughs> hated, hated. <laughs> you know, I was, you know, I was this 21 year old kid working as a manager in Staples and I was the assistant manager. So the main manager used to give me the worst hours. So I would be the guy like closing up the store 11 o'clock on a Friday night. And then opening the store again, you know, 8 a.m. On a, on a Saturday morning. Oh. So it was like the worst hours for a little pay. I think I was making $25,000 at the time and right. no real bonus. And it was just, ah, it was just terrible. My so, goodness. That just wasn't my thing. But I had to pay the rent because right. mom, mom threw me out the house. <laughs> so, He's like, you got to go. <laughs> yeah, so, so the rent had, had to be paid. So I had to do what I had to do. <laughs> So, Ron, you hold an MBA in finance and investments, right? Yep. How tough was that? Was that like the ending of everything? You thinking, you know, once I get this, this is it. I've made it. Were you at that point in time in your life, or did you know there was gonna be more? No, I just thought it would be good for my career because after I left Staples, I found out my college coach had a sister who worked at J.P. Morgan Chase. I'm like, damn, you couldn't tell me this two years ago. So, so I ended up um, getting an interview at J.P. Morgan Chase through her and got a job there. And they hired me to be kind of like, they were looking for people with customer service skills to put into a training program that right. they were having. And I was like a mutual funds relationship manager is what I was. And uh, I forget what your question was. <laughs> oh, well, you know, you hold that MBA. In oh, the MBA. Yeah, that yeah so I went, I went for my MBA because really – they had a tuition reimbursement program at J.P. Oh, Morgan. Okay. And I thought it would be good for my career. So I went for my MBA at, at, at night, like after work. Right. And I ended up getting that. I think it took me two and a half years or so. I would go all throughout the year, summertime. and But they paid for it, so it was good for me. So I ended up getting an MBA. And I also ended up going for my CFA, which is a Chartered Financial Analyst uh, designation. Right. And I ended up getting a J.P. Morgan paid for that and paid for classes for me to take that. So I just was trying to advance my wall street career and i was really into trading as well so i was trying to learn as much as i could about trading so my major in for my mba was finance and investments so at that time i haven't dis hadn't discovered anything business-wise that was better than what i was doing at, you know at jp morgan and so i just decided you know if they're going to pay for it i'm going to go for it right so was that your last job my last job after i left jp morgan in 2004 got laid off Ended up, uh, actually, the way it worked out was they were they brought in this new person, this new manager, and this new manager was assigned with pretty much laying everybody off, right? Because right. they had to cut back. So this was uh, like 2004, and I knew that I was probably gonna get laid off. So I went out and found another job at this company that did market research for other companies called uh, TNS, okay. and I got a job with them. And then I told J.P. Morgan that, you know. Lay me off. Can you lay me off? Because I want to start my own business. I appreciate it. If you're gonna look, if you're looking to lay somebody off, lay me off. Right. So they ended up laying me off, and then I went right to the other job. I took my severance, so I was kind of double dipping for a while, and that's that severance money paid for my wedding and all this stuff. So it was just a good look. And had they known that I found another job, they would have never had laid me off. You know right. what I mean? If you can leave them on your own, you don't get a severance. <laughs> but that, that ended up working out well for me. So I was actually triple dipping at the time. So I had my. The money for my business, I had the severance money coming in from J.P. Morgan, and I had the money from this new job I was working at TNS. I was a financial analyst there. So I ended up working there for three years, and then 2007, I got laid off there. I, I've been fired or laid off from, like, every job <laughs> you can think of. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the job, the job, the corporate world was definitely uh, not my cup of tea. Right. 
So yeah, after 2007, I never looked back, never went on another interview. And my business was actually making more than my job at the time, even though I was doing it part-time. Right. What was your business at the time? I had a publishing business, mainly in the, the cooking niche. So, you know, I don't just do cookbooks. I'm a cookbook author, but I also have a publishing business around that. You know, I have over 240,000 subscribers. I have, uh, you know, a big website and a community and all this stuff, you know, people that want recipes from the secret restaurant recipes is the, the niche my goodness and what made you start that i mean i just want to <laughs> you know right well i was um after i got my mba a friend of mine got a job working for a company that marketed cell phone contracts for at and t mm -hmm. and uh, he introduced me to email marketing and at the time, like he, he was in charge of that email marketing department, but all they used to do is really, this was 2001, they used to just send spam. Like, <laughs> they used to just spam the internet trying to get people to sign up for at and cell phone contracts. Right. So, so he introduced me to, to email marketing, and I started thinking to myself, this would be really cool if I could uh, build an email list and make money just by pressing send and sending out emails, and people actually wanted to receive my emails. That would be like, whoa, that would be amazing, right? So, so I, I got into list building early on, and I also got into uh, doing some direct mail marketing. And my, my, my P.O. box happened to be on a lot of different email solicitation lists because of the direct mail marketing that I was doing. So, you know, one day I was just looking for something to sell anyway. I was like, it'd be cool if I had my own product to sell. I had all these other affiliates promoting my product. So one day I just got in the mail like this uh, – this solicitation saying you can get 10 secret restaurant recipes for $5. Send us $5 in the mail. We'll send you these 10 secret restaurant recipes. And then a light bulb went off. And I was like, this could be my niche. Right. I started doing a little research and I found that the recipe market at the time, this was 2000 and 2003 at the time I got into that. The recipe market at the time was getting 93 million searches related to uh, just re the term recipe alone. 93 million searches. I don't know what it is, probably more than that now, but back then I'm like, wow, this is a gold mine. And I started looking on ClickBank and I was like, is there any other products related to this? You know, these secret restaurant recipes like Olive Garden, Red Lobster, Cheesecake Factory. That I, so I, I didn't find any other products related to that. So I was like, this would be a good product to put on ClickBank. So I created an ebook, took those 10 recipes I bought, you know, tried testing them out. They seemed to work pretty good, kind of came kind of close. So I just kind of rewrote them, put my own words in it, added a couple of different things, and they kind of became my recipes because there's no copyright on mm -hmm. recipes as long as you present it in your own words. And, uh, you know, even if you put a couple of extra ingredients in or swap out some ingredients and change it up, it becomes your recipe. So that's what I did. And I started selling this ebook, and people started promoting it. Like affiliates started finding it and promoting it and customers started buying it. And I was like, wow, this thing is really working. So I started focusing on that. I just kind of deep dive focused on that. And I, Right. The more energy I seemed to put into it, the more money came out of it. And it just became this big thing, big email list, big community. You know, I ended up between 2003 and 2008, I sold 60,000 copies of the uh, cookbook that I created. I ended up, you know, adding more recipes, making it a physical cookbook and all this stuff. But 60,000 self-published copies. And that led to me uh, getting the book deal with, with Simon Schuster. My goodness. That's remarkable, man. <laughs> Wow. Well, let me ask you this. If you had, I'm sure there were some types of issues that went on at that time. Did anything go wrong? <laughs> issues? Yeah. Uh, well, I had some issues with um, this, this one guy that was one of my competitors. He wanted to sue me. You know, I had some uh, affiliates that were using his keywords to promote my product. Right. Right. And he had a trademark on his, his brand. So they would use his brand to promote my product. So he didn't go after them. Well, he hated me, so he went after me directly. Right. right. So I probably would have won because it was no fault of my own. These were affiliates doing it and it was right. through ClickBank and I probably could have got ClickBank involved and all this stuff. But, you know, my, my attorney said to me at the time, it's like, you know, this is a federal trademark case. And, you know, I, I'm a, I cost, he was $450 an hour. Oh. <laughs> you can't find a, a trademark attorney you know, that's what trademark attorneys get paid because it's a federal case in federal federal court. And I had to fly out to California. And he said, I could make you vindicated. I could, you know, you probably win at the end of the day. But do you want to be right 
and spend $150,000 just to get in front of a judge? Or do you want to settle? I was like, ah, I think I'll settle. <laughs> oh my God. You know, so I ended up, ended up settling because the other guy didn't want to spend the money either. Right. So we ended up settling for a lot less and uh, we had an agreement. But that was just one, you know, that one legal issue that I had you know, with that uh, restaurant recipe market. So that's interesting because uh, most of our audience are actually, you know, local or off or online marketers. And to hear that someone had tried to come after you for trademarks because of affiliates, you know, I mean, how did you get over that? I mean, how do you resolve that? Because it's not your doing. I mean, you didn't have to cancel your book or anything, did you? Or No, when with the settlement agreement, I just, you know, I, I put disclaimers on the site. Right. Saying that if you're an affiliate, you cannot use trademark terms and cover my bases yeah. and all that. But I would have won that case, but it was cheaper to settle it. So when you when you when you have a settlement agreement, you put it in writing and they can't come after you ever again for anything you've done in the past. So that was the end of that. And, uh, you know, I put those disclaimers on the site and, uh, and uh, affiliate agreements and stuff like that. So that was the way I resolved it. But it's scary. Affiliates can get you in trouble. <laughs> Yeah, I was about to say, were you thinking, this is it, I'm done? Or, I mean, was there any doubt in your head? Was the voices talking to you? You know how you get those voices that tell you, oh, you can't do this, this is it, it's over. I mean, what? how did you deal with that? <laughs> no, no, I had a good, I mean, I was making good money at the time. Right. So, you know, the settlement amount that I had to pay was just kind of like a, a drop in a bucket. I could recover from it. Had it happened in 2003, then I probably would have been out of business because, I, you know, I didn't have much money. Then I was just getting started. But at the time, fortunately, it didn't happen until I was making good money from it. Wow. Wow. Um, wow, man. So what are your plans now? I mean, are you uh, continue to create more books or recipes or what, what's, what's the future look like? Well, I'm still in the recipe market, but I kind of let my wife run that niche. You know, she kind of runs those websites, runs the email newsletter. And, um, I don't have any more plans to do any more cookbooks. I've done six cookbooks with Simon and & Schuster, and I've sold over 1.5 million copies. I just got the latest uh, royalty report. So 1.5 million copies between these six books that I've done. And, um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't have any more deals in the works with them. I may go to another publisher now and get a, a book deal, but I've done six with them and made a lot of money and made a lot of money for them. And I think that's, that's it. You know, I think I've run, it's run its course. So I've just been focused on, focusing on kind of uh, reinventing myself, teaching other writers how to self-publish, teaching other writers how to get a book deal, how to write for a living. So that's kind of been my, my thing recently that I've been focusing on, doing a little coaching, doing uh, products, information products related to helping writers succeed like I did. Very nice. And what's your website again, Ron? My website is Writer Help Wanted is one of my uh, writing websites. My main website is rondouglas.com. Right. Nice. So let me ask you this. If anyone that was trying to, you know, start doing what you did, like, you know, with recipes and all that, would you recommend to do that now? Is that a time that's already passed or is that something you can still get into? I know what video marketing and all that stuff that's happening now, people are doing well as far as video vlogging. But would you recommend doing like cookbooks uh, like you have done before or? Yeah, yeah, for sure. But you just have to have an angle, right? You can't just come out with like, here's my cooking site. It has to be something to it, right? You have to have a niche. You have to have an angle like, uh, you know, 30 minute meals for uh, busy moms or something. You know, it has to be an angle. But the opportunity is certainly there because that market has such cheap traffic that you can get from Facebook, right. you know. And it's a very visual market where you can, social media works well. You know, people are always looking for recipes. People are always looking for cooking tips. People got to eat every day. So social media works extremely well. Pinterest works extremely well with the food pictures. Mm -hmm. you have, uh, Facebook works extremely well because people share recipes on Facebook. So you make a post with a really good recipe. You can get a lot of cheap traffic from it or free traffic by people sharing it. Uh, YouTube videos work really well. You know, whether you actually pay for ads, you can run YouTube ads that are really cheap in that market. So it's a real easy way to, you could build a following with not spending a whole lot of money doing it. So, you know, if you have an angle, I think you could really make a lot of money in the recipe market still. Very nice. So, uh, so you're actually helping a lot of people with different types of ideas when it comes to books now, right? Right, right. 
that's that's good because you have the foundation laid out there already. So, man, um, wow. How has this changed your family's life, man, your family completely? <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, you know, money always helps, right? right. <laughs> no, just, not just that, but just the freedom, right? I don't have to work for anybody. You know, I could I could attend my, my daughter's soccer match. I can go to my 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 son's chess competition. I, you know, I can, I'm there for them all the time. And whenever they need somebody there, I can go to student teacher meetings and, you know, I'm just an active part of their life. And I think that that's probably one thing I'm most proud of is having the ability to do that, especially after the childhood that I had. So, you know, I, it's affected their life. And I think it's helped them a lot. And they're just accustomed to dad always being there. Right. So what do you expect your children to do when they get older? <laughs> you know, I, I get <laughs> time and I'm like, you know, I'm going to let my kids do what they want to do, but there are options and they watch what you do, you know, but what do you kind of, I mean, I'm sure they're watching you and your, and your wife, you know, as y'all are staying home uh, parents and what are their ideals right now? You know, it's funny that my daughter's 11 and my son is eight. Right. And they don't really know. My, my daughter really likes animals. So sometimes she says she wants to be a veterinarian. And I was like, well, you could be a vet and you could also have your own veterinarian you know, shop where office where, where other vets work for you. Right. You know, trying to, you know, if you're gonna be a vet, own it. You know what I mean? Not don't not don't work for somebody else as a vet, own the 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 vet, you know what I mean? So I've been trying to drill that into her head. But she's uh, into all type of stuff. You know, she's still, you know, into watching T V and playing with her friends and you know, but I talk to her all the time and I just plant little seeds. Really that's <laughs> all you can really do, right? You plant little seeds and then you exposure to different things and my son too you expose plant little seeds and you expose them to different things with the hope of them catching on to it and saying okay i really like this this is my passion you know my my daughter's more of the creative type and she loves animals my son is more of the uh i guess uh what do you call it left brain type where he's more analytical more into building things more engineer type so we try to get him involved in stuff like that we send him to lego camp you know we send him to uh, computer programming for kids and things right. like that. But the other day I asked him what he wants to be. He said he wants to be a comedian. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, you want to be a comedian? He's like, yeah. I was like, well, a lot of comedians. He, he also wants to make a lot of money. He always says he wants to buy his mom a mansion. Never right. mind me. He don't want, you know, he don't want me to buy it. He just wants to do it for his mom. So, so I'm telling him like, man, you know, comedian, you know, it's kind of like feast of famine. You know, if you get real big, you could be like a Kevin Hart or somebody, yeah. but you you might end up, you know, struggling in nightclubs and might not make a lot of money. That's He's true. like, well, I want to make a lot of money. He was like, how about a police officer? I was like, well, you know, that's an honorable job, but you're not going to make a lot of money as a police officer either. Right. And he, I was like, why don't you, what, what if you would start a business like your dad? You know, business working on the internet. He was like, you work on the internet? Oh, wow. <laughs> he said, he said, he said you, you have a business? I was like, yeah, what do you think I do on the computer all the time? He's like, I thought you was playing video games or something. I don't know what you're doing, man. That's crazy. I For an like eight-year-old. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. Right? <laughs> Kids, so I don't want me to show you how to, Ask him, you want me to show you how to make money online? Come by the computer, I'll show you. He's like, I, I will a little bit later, though, because my show is on. Right? <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. So, um, how was traffic and conversion? What did you? Uh, what was your take on it? I didn't get to attend this year, but my business partner Bill, which is not here right now, he attended and he came back with a lot of great information. Was pumped up with a lot of connections. But do you go for the connections or the information? Well, I was trying to go for both, but ended up staying in this Airbnb with uh, a few friends, a few marketer friends, and we barely made it to the convention, man. We were just going there. Really, it just ended up being a networking thing. Right. We're probably going to end up buying the recordings, but I probably only went to two sessions or so. Yeah. But, you know, it seemed like it was a lot of the stuff, same stuff that they were talking about last year, mm -hmm. to be honest. But I haven't seen enough of it to really tell, but, uh, you know, from what I've seen. Well, I'm going to get the recordings and use that, but it was a lot of stuff related to different ways to get traffic, different ways to build retargeting lists. You know, it gets real technical into how to use Facebook ads and, right. and how to you use YouTube ads and, you know, how to get traffic and how to build a following and how to get free traffic as well, how to do SEO, how to do blogging, what's the latest trends in terms of uh, Google SEO and what you need to do. And, you know, right. one of the big takeaways was you, you really, what well, they talked about it last year too, you really can't game 
Google like you used to be able to do, you know, because they're they're really onto it. Their technology is so advanced that you're better off writing, trying to write. Like if you have a specific topic that you're writing a blog post about, mm -hmm. try to be the source for that topic that people are going to link to. Try to write, you know, write a 1500 word article and include include, you know, embedded YouTube videos, embedded slideshows in the article, you know, from slideshare.net. Yeah. Include, you know, embedded reports and anything. Like, just make it a resource guide in one post. And if you do that, people will link to it. You that post will be so relevant for that particular keyword that you'll end up ranking and get a lot of get a lot of traffic for it. And doing that, like writing like one big 1500 word article once a week will get you more traffic than writing a sloppy 400 word article every day. Nice. That's basically one of the takeaways. We just got schooled on here by Ron Douglas. I love it. <laughs> a lot of guys are SEO, video marketers, and that's good stuff, you know, to hear. Wow, that's that's good, man. Huh. So moving forward, um, like you said, you're just going to kind of just reinvent yourself or try to figure out what else you want to do the next level. I mean, are you going to go bigger and harder for the next thing you're going to do or – what was you know? Yeah, you know, I'm still I'm still actively building an audience. You know, I'm doing it. I'm not you know trying to do it. I'm I put out products. I put out probably about five products last year for right. the writer market. I put out a Facebook course to you know talk about some of the stuff I'm doing to build an audience with uh, Facebook ads. That course was five dollar posts. Dot right. com. I teach people how to you know laser target into interest and spend five dollars on these little ads and then scale it up from there. To test test different interests, and you know it's a whole complex course that I put together related to uh, Facebook ads, and that that did that did one hundred and nineteen thousand dollars in the first week that I put it out on on JVZoo when we had that launch. So that right. did well. I built a decent following from that, and then I did a bunch of webinars from that list as well, and made even more money. So that kind of you know was a really good month for me <laughs> for, that, for that course. That was uh, September. So right. I'm still serving, just serving my audience, sending emails providing value and monetizing it, doing some coaching, things like that. But, you know, I'm making decent money off of it. And I still have the cooking business as well. I still have the cooking publishing business. Right. I'm still sending five or six emails a week to that list. You know, cooking is a market where you could literally send a new recipe every day and people don't complain. So it's a good market to have an email list in. And I also sell ads in that market, which is like the easiest money ever, right? right. So I partners with this company called Flatiron Media. Mm -hmm. And what they are, and also dedicatedemails.com. So those are the two list brokers. They are, you know, they're, they're list brokers. What they do is they have a sales team. They go out, they find your advertisers, and then they send the advertisers and you pay them a cut of whatever the advertiser is paying. So I might sell a solo ad for $3,000 and I'll give them, you know, a third, or actually, what is it? I think it's a 20% or something like that. I'm paying them. So I give them their cut for sending me advertisers, and I'll just run the ad to my email newsletter, and it's just all profit after that. So that's like the easiest business model ever. So I still got that business, so I'm still heavily focused on building my audience in that business just to be able to monetize the email list that I'm building. Right. So, you know, I think the most important thing we have today is either our phone or the computer. If you lost everything, man. I mean, you had to completely start over. I know everybody hates to talk about that, but – what would you do if I lo or if I only had my phone and the computer? Yeah, well, I mean, if you lost all your lists and everything, I mean, everything. What would you do? I would, I would create a product. I would create a product or a software. I would go to an event, or I would uh, go on Facebook and friend everybody in a certain industry, and then I would just share what I know. Right. For free at first, just start sharing what I know. And then after that, you start building a name for yourself. Then I'll start contacting people. Well, you, could, you could partner with somebody who has a, a big following online and say, I've created this really good product. You know, I'd like to partner with you. I'd like to give you this product that you could sell. You could do a product launch with it. You know, you could do that and, and he'll sell it. He'll get his affiliates to sell it and just get a cut of it. You could do that. You could do your own product launch where, you know, you give people a percentage. And then like, say, for instance, if you had a product that was, you know, you created an information product. You just record yourself talking about different steps to achieve a certain goal, right? You focus on the market. What does that market want? What problem do they have? And how can I teach them how to fix that problem, right? You create a product, a product, one problem, one product for that problem, right? And then you 
launch it. You put it out there and you build up a little buzz before you release it. Right? You start sharing those videos, you start telling people it's coming, start building your, your own little audience for it. And then when it's released, you'll have a surge of sales and you'll be back in business in, in no time. And you can get you know other people involved in promoting it. But as long as you focus on the problem that people are having and how you can solve it with your product, then you know you'll be delivering value and it's just a matter of monetizing that value. But if you have a, a computer and a, and a mic, you can create a product. You know, you could um, download, if you were completely broke, you could download like a camstudio.com, right. which is a free uh, screen sharing software. Right. Just load up your computer, share what's on your screen and, and talk and record it. And then you have a product to sell. Very nice. You know, I think sometimes uh, a lot of people get this and they make it too difficult. I mean, you're sitting there and I'm thinking, man, he's he's right. I mean, it's real simple to just come up. There's a lot of people with uh, great ideas, you know, and they don't just put it out there. And um, I guess, um, you know, from you, you've been doing this for a while. And have you seen a couple of people just walk up to you and say, hey, I've got this. I've never shared anyone with you. But can you, what do you think about this? Have you been blown away with people's ideas like that before? Yeah, yeah, I've partnered with people before on on products and projects, and I've even gotten behind and promoted people's stuff because I just thought it'd be a good fit right. in my market. Right, that's the thing. I mean, if you focus on, like, if you have, if you if you released a product related to Facebook ads, right? Say say you have a product related to Facebook ads, and then you have an email list of customers who bought that Facebook ads product. Now, what do you do with that email list? Uh, you have to promote something. So you can't go start promoting if they bought a Facebook ads product, start telling them that SEO is the way to go. Right? <laughs> you know what I mean? You got to send them more stuff related to Facebook ads, right? Related to paid advertising. So you find products that are related to that because you know it's going to do well yeah. to your market. It's just a good fit. So that's the main thing. People come up to me. If it's a good fit, I know it's going to do well and I'll promote it. If it's not a good fit, you know, then, then I can't really do it to that list. So I have right. multiple lists in different markets, but it has to be a good fit and a good fit for my audience and they have to get value from it or else they'll just start tuning you out and won't open your emails and you know, you're not really serving them unless you're giving them something that they're interested in. I know, man. We get so many uh, different JVs trying to push things that I've never even talked about or know about and I'm like, I can't use that, man. It ain't helping us, you know? Right. <laughs> they're like, yeah, right. you can use it. It's converting. I'm like, no, man, I understand, but it's not my audience, you know? Right. Well, wow. I mean, this is the other thing. The other thing that, you know, when I, when I explain this whole thing, create a product and get people to promote it and, you know, promote it yourself and share value, the, the main obstacle I find is people start thinking to themselves, like, who am I to create a product and why should people listen to me? That's a good point. Oh, you know, and they have that obstacle. That, and they look at some of the top experts and it's like, I don't know as much as these guys. Like, you can create a product based on your own results, right? Based on your own, what you put into it is unique because it's what you've tried, right? A lot of people want to follow somebody that they can relate to, that they see going through a process of trying something that they want to do, right? Imagine if you're, you know, you want to do Facebook ads and then you see somebody posting like, okay, well, here's what I tested with this Facebook ad. Here's, it didn't really work out. So here's what I'm going to do to make the adjustment. You automatically like, wow, let's see if this guy actually can pull it off. Let's right. see if he can make it happen. You're, you're, you're intrigued by that more so than a guy saying like, ah, oh, I'm spending a million dollars a month on Facebook. And, you know, if you don't have you know, at least a $10,000 budget, then, you know, like, it's like, you, you, you're more intrigued by the little guy that's trying and going along this journey and succeeding and you see it happening than you are like somebody that you never think you could actually be like right. you know, you're a customer. So don't think of yourself as, okay, I'm not the top guy. Who am I to release a product? As long as it's valuable, as long as it's, you know, something that people can use and because you, 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 you know more than you think you know, especially if you're actually doing stuff. Right. Doing stuff, applying stuff, testing stuff. You now know 99%, more than 99% of the people who never try anything. That right? is true. They want to know what you know. Yeah, yeah that's, that's true. true. Uh, sometimes, you know, we get stuck in our heads and we think that, you know, well, I'm not going to do this and that, especially because I'm a local guy. And if I walk into a business uh, owner's office about something, I know that he's not going to understand what I'm talking about. And it's my job to educate him on what it what it is I'm trying to present to him. And he's going to see me either as an authority or a scam author. So I have to make sure that I'm trying to give him value on what uh, I'm trying to promote. 
And if the right. value comes over, uh, uh, comes by talking, then he's going to be like, hey, man, I want to, you know, do business with you. And right. uh, it's the same thing when online, if you, you know, put information out there and they see that small journey, like you're saying, that they're going on, it's going to work out for you. But I think most people have issues with just starting, you know, and um, that well, right I mean there. It's that. another thing you talk about local is another thing I picked up at uh, traffic and conversion. I actually knew, but it just kind of like, you know, you know, when you know something and you hear it again years later and a light bulb goes off again. And you're like, wow, damn, I forgot that. Well, <laughs> it was um, the value of overcoming the initial objections that customers and clients have by giving them something that's just uh, offer they can't refuse. And I'm not right. talking about like, you know, threatening to break their legs or something. I'm talking about <laughs> you know, giving them something that's just like a no brainer. Like say for instance, you you walk up to a, a pizza shop or something, right? You go into a pizza shop and you say to them, you know, listen, I am an expert at social media and, and SEO. And um, I have this software that I sell that's you know usually you know a thousand dollars a year for businesses but what i'll do is i'll give it to you for free absolutely for free and i guarantee you it's gonna get an extra you know a hundred extra thousand people to be fans of yours on your facebook page right. right and if it doesn't then you know you don't have to pay me anything but if it does then you could you know take a look at paying for the software you know make offers that to people that's going to be a win for them like one-sided, lopsided, just amazing win for them that they can't say no to, right. you know, and it make it easy, make it easy for them to get, once you get that initial yes, then you're in the door, right? But say if I were to come to that same pizza shop and say, hey, I have this software for $1,500, you know, for $1,000 a year, and it's amazing, it does all this stuff, it's worked for all these people, and, and he'll just, he'll throw you out the shop, $1,000 a year, and I don't got that right now. You know what I'm saying? It's a, total, it's a, it's a different thing with going in, like everybody else does, trying to just sell them something and going in, making them an offer that's easy for them to just accept. And like, okay, they can't, like, they just got to know whether it's going to work or not because it's such a uh, low barrier to entry, a low, low thing for them to, it's not, it's no risk for them to accept it and it's all gain for them. And that's how you get your, your foot in the door. So you can take a derivative of that example and apply it to anything that you're doing to make it as easy as possible for people to take that initial yes that micro commitment right. right which leads to more yeses down the line more commitments higher commitments once you have proven that to them you can add value right let me ask you this because i wanted to ask you this a while ago why do you think most people who are have books out there are having so much problem selling their books because they put books out without having an audience for it you know there's a gazillion books out there right so you you start you create a book you know, nobody knows about it, and then you launch it and then start promoting it. And it's like, why am I going to buy your book? You know, and then, and then it's like the book is such a low margin thing. It's not like you can get affiliates to really promote it for you. It's such low margin right. type of product. So, let's, you know, ebooks are a little bit different, but a physical book especially. So nobody knows about it, and it just kind of goes on the shelf. You might sell 100 copies or so, and it goes on the shelf. It's just another book. You want to kind of have a book launch. If you're trying to sell books, right? You want to build up anticipation for the book. You want to make maybe giveaways, uh, a free chapter of the book to let people know it's coming, to get their email list, to notify them, to get their email address, to notify them when the book comes out. You want to build up a following in that in that market, whatever the book is related to. You want to do some interviews like we're doing here. Right. You know, you want to kind of build up buzz for your book, and then put it out, and then you'll have a bunch of people ready to buy it. And then what happens, like, especially if you're self-publishing on Amazon or something, if you get that initial surge of sales, your book is going to rank well. and It's going to have that domino effect where people, your book is highly visible in the marketplace and more people are buying it. So that's what you kind of think. You want to launch your book. Don't just put it out. Build up a, a following. Build up an audience. Build up anticipation for it before you put it out. Nice. So I'm going to get a little bit nosy real quick. What did you and Tommy and old Damon do talk about this? What were y'all mastermind about? Because <laughs> y'all seem like, I mean, I get it. We've done that before. We've kind of gone and done our little mastermind on our own and got one of those Airbnbs. But what is y'all, you know, y'all got something coming up real soon? No, nothing really. I mean, we're just friends. I already knew these guys and we just, really? uh, 
just wanted to stay to you know have fun together in this little uh, Airbnb place on the beach rather than stay at the hotel. Right. So it turned out it was just nothing, but we ended up doing a a, a video a Facebook Live thing for right. uh, Tommy Powers. He right. has a video ads course that I was promoting, and that that worked out well for people to see our faces and just talk about what he has going on. And then I later on promoted it. So it's really just a thing where we get together and see how we can best support each other. It was nothing specific other than what you got going on, how can I support it? And we actually have a group that, um, you know, a mastermind group that we put together that I think Damien actually wants to invite you into it. I don't know if he told you. Hey, man, I'm all with it, man. You know what I mean? Yeah. I reached out to him last time. I was like, hey, man, what about that group you were talking about? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so we have a, a, a group together with some some prominent uh, people that you know you, you've been invited to, so we're gonna put you in the group too, so you can right. see firsthand. It's just you know a matter of, you know, it, it's when you have a, a support group of people that work together with you and try to support you and share what's working for them. You know, it's a lot easier than trying to do it all yourself on an island, trying to figure everything out oh. yourself. You know, learning from others' mistakes, learning for other from other successes, right. and having people support you, like you know, endorse your stuff when you put it out and things like that is so much easier if you have a group. And if you don't have a group, man, you really should try to find a, a group of people. I'm not saying you personally, but anybody listening, right, right. find a group of people that, like a support group where you help each other, a mastermind group. And you want to, well, first you want to build your own audience, build your own thing. So you have, have something to, to add, something to bring to the table. And then you want to find other people who are kind of on your level or even greater. And you make more collaborating in a mastermind than you would just kind of on your own. So. Yeah, that's, that's true. I think, I think uh, what took off for us is actually going to events and actually meeting with people and doing JVs with them. You know, before, I used to go to all these events, learn everything, learn everything, and then that was it. I would go home on my own. Mm. And then some had to change. I was like, where are these other guys? These big timers are not even in the room. I'm like, what is going on? You know what I mean? Yeah. And so finally, they're out there making deals with each other. And I'm like, oh, it all makes sense. And after that, I was hooked. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, for sure. Like uh, my boy, uh, Kevin Madison. Right. He was really early on the Periscope trend. He got in real early and built a huge following. I think he's one of the you know, top 50 people on Periscope in terms of the amount of followers he has on, on Periscope and how active they are. So, you know, he's been doing that. And he just recently said to all of us in the group, Say, you know, I want to do an interview with each of you guys where I talk to you and then feature your products at the end and, you know, get get ex give right. you exposure to my audience on Periscope. So right. he gets to have more content created and he right. gets to help people in the group and we get to get exposure from it. So it's like a win-win just from being in that group. That is awesome, man. Wow. Well, I know you're busy today, man. I'm glad that you stopped by and actually give me your time, man. Um uh it, it's been amazing i'm sure my audience love this because of the content you uh, represent here how can we get a hold of you again irondouglas.com is my main site or you can find me on facebook uh, facebook.com forward slash like ron douglas right and we can find your books on there as well well you can find my books on amazon the, the cookbooks are called uh, america's most wanted recipes they feature restaurant recipes, copycat restaurant recipes. There's six different ones out there. There's a grilling book. There's a, you know, low fat restaurant recipe book. There's a, you know, a kids edition, kids favorite. There's a dessert book that, you know, there's a bunch of them out there on Amazon, but you could definitely find them. If you search Ron Douglas on Amazon, you'll, you'll find the uh, cookbooks as well. Very nice. Yeah, man. I kind of want you to figure out that recipe from uh, Premier Deli, that cake, <laughs> man, that Oreo cake, man. <laughs> <laughs> it was good. Every, every time we go to New York, that's my first stop. I don't even check in the hotel. I go there first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got to check that out. I don't think I've ever been to the Premier Deli. Yeah, Which man. On? It's on uh, 55th and 7th Avenue. Okay. Yeah, see, I don't even know. I'm like... <laughs> you know, the street and everything. Yeah, <laughs> that's what's up. I got to check it out. Yeah, yeah awesome, awesome. Well, I'd like to thank everyone for joining uh, once again for Saturday Cup of Joe. Uh, if you have any questions or comment, you can go to the website of SaturdayCupofJoe.com. There's a microphone to the right of the website, and you can kind of speak your mind. I love the feedback that you guys are giving us. Uh, once again, you can watch this episode on the replay. I'll shoot this out to the email as well. And if uh, we'll also have Ryan's bio 
um, for you on, on our site so you can connect with him and look at the books and go buy that book as well because I'm sure some of you guys out there need to learn how to cook. I can cook for myself. I was thinking, who is this Ryan? He you know, made it happen. I should be doing stuff like that, you know? <laughs> but it's all good, brother, man. I, I thank you so much for coming on here, man. Once again, we love. I love to see you guys in that group whenever y'all get me in, whenever. I, I'm excited already. You got me pumped up, man. <laughs> all right, man. Thank you. Thank you for everybody watching, and I appreciate the opportunity to share what I know with your audience. Awesome, awesome, you, awesome. So we'll see you guys next week. Have a great weekend, guys. Be uh, out there, you know, keep grinding, keep your hustle game going. Don't give up. Don't listen to the haters because they're just jealous of what you're doing. So no matter what, be you. Hey, peace out, guys. We'll talk to you soon.